Good morning and welcome to Trinity Bible Church. We're so glad to have you here this morning on this hot July day and we're looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us. We're going to start off our service as we always do with our pledges and the prayer. If you would please stand and join us, the pledges will be available for you to read on the screens. Pastor. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whom we take the stand, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again, with life and liberty for all who believe. Let me leave this is my Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. I will hide the words in my heart, that I may not sing against God. Let us pray. Anoint us with your spirit, speak to our hearts as we come together to exalt your name and bring praise and honor and glory to our Lord and Savior. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Please remain standing, and as you do, take your hymn books. Then turn to hymn number 537 and let's sing together, Jesus Saves. Hymn 537, Jesus Saves. <laughs> Bible school. Now, I think I've been going to vacation Bible school 
for a very, very long time, and um, decades, one might say, and, and being part of that. And we look forward to it. This year, it is, looks like this. These are in the foyer to take home, to invite your friends and your neighbors and your family. It's Stompers and Chompers. All right, so we already have a vote of confidence from one of the attenders of BBS. Uh, Stompers and Chompers, we're looking for that. It's about dinosaur building dino-sized faith in God's big plan. You don't want to miss that. It's going to be an exciting, fun time, and that's going to be... Uh, we're going to decorate on this Wednesday, then it'll start next Sunday, and it'll be Sunday through Thursday. Is that right? Okay, Sunday through Thursday, and that's from 6... 8.30 p.m. every night. So if you can't make all the nights, that's okay. Come on the night you can. But we want you to make every night. And uh, I'm going to make every night. So, And we also have opportunities for adults and an adult class. So we're going to do that. We also have opportunity for volunteers. So if you have not volunteered, you'd like to volunteer, we do have a sign-up sheet in the back. And we'd ask you to fill that out. I want to also invite you to our men's prayer breakfast, which is every Saturday at 7 a.m. I know some of you, like me, don't realize that there are two sevens in a Saturday. 7 a.m., 7 p.m. Okay. But it's 7 a.m., and uh, we would invite you to come to that. That's every Saturday. We have a, a, a good spread of breakfast, and then some fellowship, and then some teaching time from a devotional uh, speaker. And we would love to have you be part of that 7 a.m. Saturday mornings. Uh, let's see here. Fish Fry coming up July 29th, Saturday at 5 p.m. We're planning on that being the hottest day of the year. <laughs> so that's why it's a fish fry, because it's a fish and fellowship fry. We're all going to fry. No, it'll be fine. We're going to have a great time. Pastor does a great job of getting the fish together. And we have a special cook this year, right, Pastor? Okay. So you don't want to miss that. We're going to have a, a great time together. It's, uh, you know, my, my family gets tired of hearing this. I hope y'all don't. But I'm going to do it anyway. Which is, it's the food that brings you here. It's the fellowship that keeps you here. Amen. Okay? So uh, I want y'all to come and be a part of that. I always love getting to know people at those events. Because it seems like we get into church and we got five minutes before service, five minutes after service. And if you don't get to know people, and I don't know how you would in five minutes, in those five minutes, you don't get to know them. And so when you get these fish fries and events like that, you get to spend time and talk and find out uh, what they do, where they're from, and how they grew up, and uh, what they like to do, fish or, or run big track hoes and dump people in ponds and things. You know, you get to find out all these exciting things. It's great. So uh, be here for that. There are other things uh, in, your, in your announcements. I want to uh, remind you to look at all of them. We are updating our church directory. So, um, could Sharon, could you hold up one of those visitor cards, please? Cards right there in the pew pocket. If you would take one of those and you would like to update your information, please do so on that card. Put it in the offering envelope. This is not a one-time deal, so we'll be going over this. Um, and, and just put update on there so we know that, and then we'll... we'll use those to update our directory. We also have our YouTube on every uh, week, and I want you to know that I was um, on a family camping trip this last week, and I was not able to attend our service here at Trinity, but I want you to know that I did watch the service on YouTube. So it's a wonderful opportunity to stay in touch, even if you're not there or not available. So make sure you go on there, that you like it, you share it, or subscribe to it, and uh, be a part of our YouTube ministry there. Um, if you want to get our updates, see Miss Lee Williams for right here for uh, uh, email contact, and we'll get you that information also. All right, there are other things in there for you to review, and we would encourage you to do so. And at this time, we're going to stand up and we're going to sing hymn number 538, I Love to Tell the Story. Hymn 538, please stand and sing with us just one page over, I Love to Tell the Story.
Mr. Officer Ferrer.
audition went really well. And that I don't think a uh, hundred boys choir could have done any better. Hey, so he wants to remain standing, if you would, and sing what number fast? 609. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. This is a little impromptu here on Sunday morning. 609. 609. So if you would pull up a hundred pages back, <laughs> and we will sing 609 together. It's a, uh, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. Discrediting him. 
He said, do I come to you for credibility with uh, accommodation from Jerusalem? Do I come to you with the authority of men? I come to you with the Word of God. And the proof of my ministry is what the Word of God does and has done and is doing. How you folks at Corinth, Corinth was a very ungodly place. How you folks at Corinth have become born again believers. Your lives have been changed. Your lifestyles have been changed. Your loves and your dislikes have changed. You love the Lord and the Word of God. And you love singing songs and hymns and referring to the scriptures. You no longer love those dark, ungodly places. He said, this, that is my epistle. That is my epistle. And so this is what he's talking about here. The footprint of God in the lives at Corinth was his epistle. What God did through his preaching of the word of God that brings about the change. That is his epistle. Okay? Trinity Bible Church is a, a, a wonderful body of believers that love the Lord, and this is our epistle. Folks come to the altar here quite often. Two Sundays ago, after the invitation and folks went home, Johnny Smith, now when I first met Johnny, his wife came, and I'd go visit them. I'd get in, Johnny wouldn't be there. And so the next time I took a wife and I'm coming and got there, Johnny wasn't there. You see, Johnny had some issues in life and he didn't want to be around a preacher. But then Johnny became a born-again Christian. And two Sundays ago, he told his daughter, Crystal, that I, I felt like pushing you down to the altar this morning in invitation. And Crystal said, I, I wish you had. This past Sunday, if you were here, you saw or come down. I saw the biggest smile, the happiest face, and I saw a man who came from not being a Christian by far to being a born-again Christian and has values. That is the footprint of Trinity Bible Church. Amen. Where people come to know Christ as their Savior, the Word of God touches their hearts, and God works in their lives. And I'm so thankful to be a part of this ministry. I'm so thankful to be a part of your lives and how God is working. And Paul is saying here, this is my epistle. You folks are my epistle. And he says here, and he addresses how they themselves are called, declared to be the epistle of Christ. Now, whether you or I like it or not, as professing Christians, we are the epistle of Christ. Good or bad, right or wrong, make mistakes or not making mistakes, we are. And when people who aren't Christians see us, they look to us as the example of a Christian. What is a Christian? Well, I'm hesitant to say Somebody's name, that's the example of a Christian. Well, it's important that you realize that you are leaving a footprint. I was in uh, New Guinea, and I was way up, way, up in, way up in the country, up here where they still practice cannibalism. And I met a missionary from Australia, and he began to speak of another missionary. I, I go ahead, humbly say, and he said, "You look like John. John was your brother." And I said, "Yeah." He said, "Brother John." left a big footprint in the beginning. And he said, what's important about a missionary is not while they're there, but what's going on 10 years after they're gone. What's important about our ministry, okay, is what God is doing, what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will continue to do in our lives. And that is the believer's epistle, okay? That is the example the proof of the work of God is what is our epistle, what he does in our lives. Psalmist said, oh, taste and see the Lord is good. Taste and see. Often, 
this young lady was a tour guide. Her name was Angie, or is Angie, and uh, they would tour the old city, Charleston, and they would go down to the Battery, and they'd come to the curb where two streets came together, and it was the Murray Boulevard that joined the Limehouse Street. And she would ask the bus driver to stop right now. And she would get everybody to look out the window and say, see that slab of stone there on the sidewalk? You see, etched in that cement, when that cement was wet, the name David plus Sissy. She said, David was my father. Sissy, my mother. And when they were, she was 12 and he was about 14, they got to know each other. And he, one day, they poured this fresh slab of cement on the sidewalk. And he went over and etched the, his name and uh, plus her name. They later got married. They bought a house a block away. And they raised their family right here. That is an epistle to the longevity of my parents and their happy marriage. And so she found out later that the city was going to replace that section of sidewalk. So she got permission to get that slab of cement. It's now in her backyard. Now that was the epistle to the life of her parents. Okay. You, we, we each are leaving a footprint. Now if you'll notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we we'll go back to verse number 2. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. And we read about it today. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, I have been called, you have been called. We are each day living that role of being an epistle of Christ making him known, ministering to others. Written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not in the tables of stone. Remember the Mount Sinai experience? When God wrote the Ten Commandments in stone? And it was a very exciting time. It was bigger fireworks that day there than you ever seen in your life here in Charleston. We had some Real nice fireworks this past week, didn't it? Thundering and lightning and... Okay. But then he goes on, as you read through the scriptures, you'll find in verse 4, And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. So how is it that I can be this epistle that will please God? It's not of myself. It's my relationship with God. Verse 5, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves. Go down to the last part. Our sufficiency is of. Our sufficiency is of God. Okay? Who also hath made us able ministers. Paul talks about this in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. I thank my God, I thank my Lord Jesus Christ who hath enabled me by putting me in the ministry. Notice he is saying, I didn't do this. The Lord enabled me and put him in the ministry. Why did the Lord enable him? Because he was faithful. It doesn't say because he was at all the talents and all the bells and whistles. Because he was faithful. What is it the Lord would have of us? To be faithful. To always be faithful in the things of the Lord. What did we talk about last week? Have a Bible by your bed. Have a Bible in your car. Have a Bible in your den. Have a Bible in your kitchen. Have the Word of God somewhere. And if you have a few minutes, then read it. Memorize verses. So be faithful in the Lord. You are our epistle, he says, because you are clearly declared to be an epistle of Christ. Clear to all, Christ has done a work of grace in our lives. Hence, credentials. What are our credentials? The work of Christ in our lives. In May of 1964, I was asked as a young little wet behind the ears preacher, had 
just gotten married a few before that, to preach at the high school uh, doing the chapel time. And I preached a message, I couldn't tell you right now what I preached, but I shared the gospel. And afterwards, a young man came to me and asked me all kinds of questions. Now, this was when Timminsville was thriving in the cotton and the tobacco industry, and lots of things were happening. And I shared with him the gospel, the plan of salvation. He was working the next day at the tobacco warehouse, and he got on his knees by a stack of tobacco and asked Christ to come in his heart. He later felt called to the ministry. He preached his very first sermon. Uh, at our youth service for he boarded and trained in, Timmons, in Timmonsville to arrive to college. And he preached the sermon, The sun is shining, but I am blind. He came to Charleston and founded the church and passed to that church until his health broke. God works through the Word of God. And if the Word of God is being preached, then God is working. And God has called and founded Trinity Bible Church, to be an epistle of Christ, preaching and teaching and sharing the Word of God to those who have ears that are hungering for the Word of God. I have I had um, cataracts um, removed. And and the first one that was removed, I watched him do it. And I, I said, I saw you do this. He said, no, you did. not I quit your sleep. I said, well, I'll tell you what you did, and then you tell me whether I, whether I was asleep or not. And I told him, you were a boy, weren't you? And I said, yeah, I was... Watch it, making sure you did it right. <laughs> he said, you won't watch for the next time. So the next time, he banged me out. <laughs> well, you don't know who was around you when that happened, you know. When he put me to sleep, there was a couple of folks around. But next thing you know, there's a whole bunch. And here's what was so wonderful about that. As I was recovering from my second cataract surgery, this little sweet boy said, I'm Susie Biggers. You led me to the Lord at youth camp. That was a blessing beyond measure. Okay? I was still can't see. I'm, I'm still being re restored. But here's someone who shared with me how they became a Christian through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our epistle. Okay? That is it. Having Johnny come down with Bristol, I was at her bedside when... I wouldn't have given you a penny for her life. I had no idea she was going to survive. But she did. And she came down as old. Amen. And she smiled. I didn't do that. The word of God. The believer is called, go back to verse 3, ye are here, shown as a letter to be the epistle of Christ. Go to verse 7, it refers to the being engraved in stone. Goes back to the law, the days of Moses, and how that was an exciting time. But it was the law. But what's exciting about the law is not near as glorious as Christ and the covenant we have in Him. But the law brings brought us to Christ. Anytime that you're a serious person about sharing the gospel it's almost imperative that you that you start off with the Ten Commandments have you ever broken any of the Ten Commandments and right away when I say that I said I have um, I stole a little brain cracker one time at a mom and pop store on the shelf I thought you could get it I got it I was eating it my wife <clears throat> saw what I had done and a few days later I was able to sit down okay <laughs> you got that one, didn't you? <laughs> Start off with the Ten Commandments because it's the Ten Commandments that brings us to the sense of the awareness of our sins, the responsibility of our lives, and coming into Christ as our Savior. You know the story of Ahab and this vineyard he wanted, Naboth's vineyard. Ahab had this little palace, you know, where he had all the guys would go and they'd have their trophies on the wall and all this kind of stuff. And, and um, somebody gave me a, a comic book with, about this, and it shows this guy sitting in his lounge chair all relaxed back on the wall of these, these animals, and, and, and his wife is sitting on there, she's uh, crocheting, 
and the big moose head behind the guy fell off the wall and crashed down on his head. And she sat there and uh, missing, missing, a, missing a stitch and said, you got what you deserved. <laughs> well, this is what Ahab's place was. And he warned this land right next to his palace to grow herbs and so forth. And he offered to buy from Naboth. And Jewish people were not allowed to sell their land. He gave it to your children, what have you. He said, I can't do this. It's not God's will. Jezebel, so he goes home and pouts in the corner, nose stuck in the corner. Jezebel comes home and says, what's going on? Da, da, da. I'll take care of this. And so she plotted a feast, had Naboth as a guest, had two witnesses to testify that Naboth had cursed God and well, blasphemed it, and she had him stoned. Okay? And Elijah told Ahab, the dogs will you know, take care of her later, and, and the dogs will lick up the blood by the fountain, of your blood by the fountain, like the dogs did for Naboth. Later, Ahab is in a battle, and everything is going pretty well, and, and he is riding his chariot, and this guy from driving, and a guy, I like this, because I, I love archery, and I enjoy shooting well. And this soldier saw this chariot kicking up the dust going across that, and he just drew back and just, you know, see what's going to happen. And Ahab had this armor on, and it's laced up in the back, and that's the only little peep hole that there is, and the arrow finds its way in there. Ahab says, you know, I'm wounded. Take me out of here. He dies. They take the chariot down to that same pool where the uh, was washed the blood earlier of Naboth. And when they were washing the chariot, those same dogs came out and licked that blood. You see, the law condemns us and brings us to Christ. Okay. It's important that we realize the value of the law. He talks about that as he makes reference to it there in verse 7 and verse 8. How shall not the administration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the administration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the administration of righteousness. Because the cause of the law brings us to Christ. Move back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 16. To the one we are the Savior of death unto death, and to the other the Savior of life unto life. And who is sufficient of these things? What are you talking about here? As he set the stage for this conversation. To be saved, Christians are the aroma of the life leading to life. Of the Christian he is the aroma of the life leading to life. Okay? To the saved, all right, to the perishing, the aroma of the aroma of death leading to death. What is he saying in that text? What the Lord didn't refer to this, the refreshing fragrance of life itself brings life to those who believe. Death may smell of doom to those who refuse to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. So it's important that we realize the circumstances. What the ark meant to the Philistines when they captured it was death. What the ark meant to the children of Israel was life and blessing. So it's important that we realize in this that we are administering the breath of life. And our epistle is the offering of life. Now if you go to verse 3 again, for as much as ye are ministered, uh, manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. So this is the significance of the born-again Christian as we are called to, um, as Christians, uh, epitaph, our, our uh, epistle is that of 
the Holy Spirit. Now, there's no work that I do that has any value or significance. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. It was not I that brought Johnny to the altar of salvation. It was the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that brought about the conversion of this minister. It was the Holy Spirit that brought Carol Joy to the altar of salvation, who's now a pastor. It was the Holy Spirit that brought a little Miss Diggers, who had the courage as a, whatever occupation she had there with the doctor, nurse, or whatever. Well, I'm still can't see. She speaks up and says, Pastor Owens, you led me to Lord when I was a little girl. It's the Holy Spirit that brings about that kind of work. And we see this in the latter part of verse 3 as he refers to the Spirit of the living God. We have very interesting discussion this morning in our Sunday class about the fig. The fig is the symbol of Israel. And if you go there to where the children of Israel came back in 1948, you'll see a large forest of fig trees. Now, the fig is the best source of iron, or one of the good sources of iron. And if you pick a fig when it's not righty, right, it's bitter. It has a lot of iron in it. But right at the very last, it's flooded with sugar, large volumes of sugar. Then it's a very delightful way to partake of a fruit that gives you the substance of iron strength. Before, you became, before I became a Christian, I was like that bitter iron, okay? When I accepted Christ as my Savior, the sugar came in, the love of Jesus Christ, and turned that bitter iron to something sweet and delicious. And so we find here, he is declaring that we are, we are Christ's epistle, and it is the Holy Spirit that does the work. It is the Holy Spirit, okay? We have an old covenant, the law. We have a new covenant, grace. Have you ever heard of Pete Rose? Cincinnati is? Yes. You're all too young, aren't you? You ever heard of Johnny Bench? You know, I was a catcher coming up in school. And I had this awful blow to my nose and broke my nose. Johnny Bench and I are about the same age. If I had not had that horrible experience, Johnny would have stayed on the bench. <laughs> We're still thinking. What is the connotation of the name Pete Rose to you? What is the connotation of the name Johnny Bench? I have a baseball signed by uh, Johnny Bench. We used to go and my wife's folks were from Cincinnati up in that area, and so we'd go and watch Cincinnati play in Atlanta. Okay. And I went up there one day doing the warm up, and I motioned for Pete Rose to sign the baseball for my son. He turned all the way and well, he looked my way. John the Bench came way over and signed the baseball for me. There were some mistakes made. John Bench, uh, Pete Rose had his name, a street in Cincinnati named after him. But he went down the tube, and they took the name down. You see, the law we condemned without Christ. With Christ, we are redeemed. And because of our redemptive experience, the life we now live is an, is an epistle of what Christ does, and what he is able to do, and what he'll do in our lives. The law, how many people died when the law was given at Mount Sinai? 3,000. How many people were saved at Pentecost? 3,000. That's no coincidence. You see, so we are given the opportunity by the power of the Holy Spirit to be a living epistle for Jesus Christ. Now here's what is a bit unusual. You go back to verse 3. Not in tables of stone, referring to the law of Ten Commandments, but in fleshly tables of the heart. 
And we always think as Christians, you know, the flesh, the flesh, you've got to, you've got to suppress the flesh. You've got to, and so, right for so when it comes to the of sin. But, notice what verse 5 says in our text. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Okay? But to whom is this sufficiency given? Go over to verse 15, chapter 3, 2 Corinthians. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Referring to the Jewish people, but this, sex, this text is not just referring today to the Jewish people only. It's referring to anyone who's not a born-again Christian. I did want to most ridiculous things in my life. I walked out of church one Sunday morning after under conviction and did not accept Christ as my Savior. That's like taking a rope and walking across Niagara Falls, you know. You may or may not make it. Every day you may or may not make it. I did not accept Christ as my Savior the first time I came to conviction. A foolish, foolish mistake. We find that there in verse 15, that veil upon their heart. But even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. He's referring to the Jewish people, but he's referring to anybody who doesn't accept Christ. But, they, but, verse 16, nevertheless, when it, the heart, when it, the heart, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Gentiles, Jews, that make a difference. If they do not know Christ as their Savior, they have been blinded by Satan. This veil, okay? When they open their hearts towards Christ, the veil is lifted. Is, is lifted. When it turns to, when the heart turns to the Lord, things happen. And that's when someone comes to the Lord for salvation, for example. Now, notice something of special importance as we come to verse 17. Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. Freedom. What is that saying? As an epistle of Christ, you have, I have the freedom, I have the opportunity, each and every day, to be everything the Lord would have me to be, in the flesh, as an epistle of Christ. You see, wiggle your right foot, big toe. Can you do that? You do that. All right, wiggle your big toe on your left foot. You do, that. Uh, do your fingers like this. Uh, this finger does that because I'm going to catch it and be a bit more careful not to get back. So my finger does that. This one does. But this is where I live. And I've lived there 40 years. Excuse me, 50, haven't you? <laughs> but, the, but the day will come when I will not live in this temple. Okay. I don't have another 80 years ahead of me. Maybe I do, I don't know. But while I am in this house of flesh, I am free to be an epistle for Christ. From this day forward, bringing glory to his name, by the life I live, the things I, the things I think, the things I say, the places I go, what I do. I pray as I prepare my sermon. Believe it or not, I do study. As though this is going to be my last sermon. Because someday it will be my last sermon. I hope and pray 20 years from now. Okay? But that day will come. But, but now, in this house of clay, flesh, I can be a living epistle of Christ. And people can learn of him and find out about him through my testimony. Ecclesiastes, Ezekiel, excuse me, chapter 11, verse 19. For I will give them one heart, I will put a new spirit within you, 
I will take the stone heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. The Lord will give you the flesh that will bring glory to his name that you're free to do whatever. You're free to be a shining example as an epistle of Christ or otherwise. There are some 18 songs in our hymnal that were written by a lady. She lived between 1820 to 1915. I'll read to you some of the wording from her hymns. Page 89, all the way my Savior leads me. For I know that, for I know where befall me, for I know where, what fire befall me, Jesus doth all things well. Gushing from the rock before me, lo, the spring of joy I see. Another song, tell me the story. Tell me the story so tender. Tell me so clearly I might see. Another hymn. Will Jesus find us watching? Say, will he find you and me still watching? Another hymn. Visions of rapture now burst in my sight. Another hymn. I know I shall see his beautiful, my beautiful Savior. I know I'll see him. We find another, when the bright and glorious morning comes, I shall see him. Another stanza, and his smile will be first to welcome me. I shall know him, I shall know him by the print nails of his hands. You know who that was, Van Age of six weeks old, she became blind. She memorized all the verses in the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. She memorized all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. She, mem she memorized the entire book of, of, Pro of the Proverbs and much of the uh, book of Psalms. She said this at the age of 85. His holy book has nurtured my, eter eter my entire life. She viewed blindness as a special gift from God. She said, oh, God gave me soul vision. It was the best thing, she continues, that could have ever happened to me. How in the world could I have lived such a helpful life had I not been blind? Francis Abigail from England writes to her a poem as they were pen pals. They never met. She writes to Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby, actually her name was Francis Crosby, but everybody knows her as Fanny Crosby. Sweet, blind singer over the sea, tuneful, jubilant, how can it be? Oh, her heart can see. Oh, yes. Her heart can see, and its sight is strong and swift and free. You see, it was in her house of flesh, blind from six weeks old. She never did see the sunrise or the daisies blooming. Never did see the amber green grass of Scotland, or never witnessed the beauty of this life and world we live in. But in her flesh, she served the Lord faithfully and truly, and she was an epistle. And you can hardly pick up this hymnal and sing a song that you don't love dearly, and it's not one of them. And she was led by the Holy Spirit through her knowledge of Scripture. That's why her hymns you can tell it came from the Spirit of God. That's why we like to sing a lot of these old hymns, because you can tell these people knew the Lord, and they wrote those 
So those heavens, based on their experience, their personal experience with the Lord. Songs that we sing are not just to make you feel good, because it sounds good, but to teach us. In the old days, prior to John Wesley, just what all the songs were actually scripture. You sang songs out of the Bible. So it's important that we realize the significance that while I'm in this house of flesh, I can be an epistle for Christ. Stephen was being stoned. Let's go back to this last verse of our text, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed unto the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I repeat. But we all, with open face, Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed unto the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. This person was being stoned to death. In his dying moments as stones crushed his ribs and could hit him snap like sticks as his other bones of his body were being broken with huge stones Something interesting happened, and the scripture says, Stephen looked up and to see the Father and Jesus Christ. During that moment, here's what Jesus said when he was being crucified. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here's what Stephen said when he was being stoned. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Here's what the Lord said on the cross. Father, unto thy hands I commend my spirit. Here's what Stephen said when he was being stoned, perhaps his last breath. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You see, Stephen was looking at Jesus as he was dying. And he had the very same thoughts, feelings, understanding of the awfulness of their sin and how they need to be forgiven. And how the sweetness of slipping away to the arms of the Lord and so we find this be a blessing. This verse says, verse 18, but, you, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You know, I, I've always said, I hope that if I'm killed in an accident that the car will hit him in the rear and I'll even not know it's coming, okay? If I'm shot with be in the back of the head and I'll not even know somebody's shooting at me. Or if I'm dying of something, it'll be, be quick. But you know, the more I think about it, I would like to be able to consciously leave a testimony that in my last dying breath, Stephen did, a testimony. Letting people know. Letting people know. My brother had an interesting experience and he saw some things when he thought he was going to die in the Fast forward, he's on his deathbed. I was not able to be there and he would pass away. And the hospice would say to the family, he's gone. This is the last breath. We'd gasp again and fall for battery. And then he would go. The hospital said, he's now gone. This is it. <laughs> you see, he saw heaven one time and he told me about it. And I think he wanted to tell me some more about it. You're going to see heaven. Okay? You know the Lord your Savior. And let's pray that even to our very last hour, we can be an epistle for Christ. Yeah. That people can read us and know Christ as a result of it. People can read our lives and know how to become a Christian, how to live the Christian life, how to conduct yourself as a Christian. We went by to see Lynn this morning. He's been in a lot of pain. But he was smiling this morning. So I said, I'm going to tell the folks, 
he was smiling this morning. It's the first time he smiled since he had his open heart surgery. But he's smiling. And he sends you his loving prayer. Father, we thank you that we can be a, a living epistle to you. While still in the flesh, may the Lord be recognized the opportunity and the freedom we have. We thank you, Lord, for the sweet spirit of Trinity Bible Church, the sweet hearts to come together and love each other and enjoy being together. We thank you, Lord, for the up and coming vacation Bible school. We pray God for it. Lots of excitement and getting together and folks might come to Christ this year. Pray God that others would become more interested. Anoint us, anoint the church. May we be a living epistle until our last breath of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, to any here that do not know Christ as their Savior, we give them opportunity, Lord, to come to the altar and trust Him now as we go through the service. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We'll ask uh, our song leader to come forward and lead us in our closing song. And we'll, of course, give you an invitation to salvation. Please take your hymn books with me and stand and sing hymn number 390, I Surrender All, as our invitation and closing hymn. The Lord has spoken to your heart this morning. Please know that our altar is always open. Pastor is always available here to speak with you. We would encourage you to move as the Holy Spirit moves you as we sing together, I Surrender All, hymn number 390. 